from the book of Job. You don't hear much from the book of Job. But we're going to look at it. Amazing. When I first became a Christian, I thought it was Job. You know? I never heard of anybody. You go into a store and say, can I have a Job? You know, I don't know what they do. Uh, amazing. And when you're early Christian, uh, I'm Job, Job 38 is what I'm going to be reading from. If you're an early Christian, you get excited about the Lord, but you don't know a whole bunch. I started uh, street preaching some before I even knew what was going on, and I found I preached my best sermons out of the book of Concordance. A lot of good verses in Concordance, you know. Anyway, uh, Job chapter 38, beginning in verse 4. This is towards the end of the book, and the Lord is now speaking to Job and kind of settling it out. There's a lot more I don't understand about Job than I do, but uh, it's it's still a good book, and, and I've understood some things. But anyway, in verse 4, uh, the Lord is speaking, and he tells Job, he says, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? Or on what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who enclosed the sea with doors when bursting forth it went out from the womb? When I made a cloud its garment and a thick darkness its swaddling band, and I placed boundaries on it and set a bolt and doors. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for being here with us, and, and I ask you, Lord, to... Speak to us today. Touch our hearts and touch our minds and help me as I share this very important subject, but one that is not without its share of controversy and misunderstanding, and just help us to see what the truth is so we can worship you who is the personification of truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to share with you about creation this morning. And I'd like to start by, by sort of just, in my heart, I'm, I'm very upset and very concerned and even sad that so often as this subject is discussed and debated, for some reason it rises strong emotions and people start attacking almost uh, in a, in a crazy kind of way, people who have honest disagreements that are on the other side of the issue. And I would like for us to, to be able to, to grasp what this is all about as far as creation goes, and to be able to really worship the Lord of creation. Uh, one example I have concerning this, I've got a tape series, it's maybe probably 10, hour, 10 hours or more, of really good teaching on creation. It's by a man who's a Christian who uh, has a doctor's degree in science. In fact, he used to be a science teacher. And he felt compelled by the Lord to go on the road and he set up a bunch of things. And, but the problem is he, he ridicules people who believe in evolution. And I'm thinking, why can't we look at this and look at the facts and, and have an honest, open debate and look at what's going on here so that we can seek the truth together. So I'd, I'd be hesitant to publicly present these tapes because if somebody does believe in evolution the way he comes across, it's just going to make him get hard and, and say, well, I'm not going to believe what you say. You've insulted me, so I'm not going to be open to anything you have to say. Um, another scripture I think is important as we look at this subject is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. The Lord does not want us to have the mind of the world. He wants us to have the mind of Christ. Now, I believe that the Lord has primarily revealed himself to us in two major ways. There's lots of ways that he will reveal himself to us. He may speak to your heart. There's all, he's, he's not limited. The Lord is fully able 
to reveal himself to you any way he wants to. But there's two major ways that I've observed. One is through the Word, the Holy Bible. As we read and as we study and as we understand the Scriptures, we have a greater understanding of who the Lord is, who Jesus is, what He's accomplished, what His purpose is for the world. Uh, last weekend we had a Bible uh, overview seminar. I'm disappointed that the, the attendance was low because I thought it was a good opportunity for us to look at the Bible as a whole and see the consistent message of the Word of God. And that's one major way the Lord has revealed Himself to us is through His Word. The other way the Lord's revealed Himself to us is through creation. Creation. As we look at the mountains, as we look at the beauty of the, the ocean waves, as we look at the rock formations, as we look through rivers and streams, as we look at this time of year, it's gorgeous. We go out and the leaves are starting to change. There's still a lot of green, but there's, there's areas. I've been going up to Louisville lately, and, and on the side of the road, sometimes there'll be hillside, and the whole, the whole hillside is now an array of colors of oranges and reds and yellows and the beauty of creation. When I went to seminary, I was, uh, went from college into the Army. When I was in the Army was when I got called to preach. And I went then into seminary. And uh, I was surprised that most of the seminary students were older than I was. I thought they'd be right out of college and go straight into seminary. But they weren't. They were in, uh, they were in regular occupations, you could say. And then somehow the Lord came in their life and they felt a call upon them. And so they came to school. And many of those that I went to seminary with were scientists. They were biologists and they were chemists and they were archaeologists and, and who were the, anyway, but they were, they were all these in the scientific field. And I talked to them and they said, you know, it was, it was working with the creation of God. As I looked and saw how God was, was doing things through nature, I felt compelled to love Him and worship Him and serve Him. I was, I was at a seminar uh, for, for pastors to speak about cancer. It was a cancer seminar in a hospital. And this doctor got up very intelligent and he talked about DNA and how com complex it is and how it came to, comes together and all the things of the, the, the intricate detail of one little cell in our body. And I was going, and I was getting really excited because look what God has done. Yeah, it's, it's obvious God came in and he created us in such a way that all that complexity inside one little cell was like that. And then he, then he said, and of course all of this happened because of billions of years of evolutionary something. And I went berserk. I mean, it was in a pastor's conference and I said, hold on, time out. I said, you just proved an intelligent design. You just proved that God, only God could put that together. What you said makes as much sense as taking a bottle of ink, throwing it off the roof of this building and having it splatter on the ground and you've got the front page of the Orlando newspaper. You can just read it word for word exactly the way it is. I said, that's not going to happen if you throw the ink out. And, and, what you're, and, and I was really hoping, expecting other preachers to jump in, but they were kind of like, well, I don't want to get involved. You know, but, but I thought, you're nuts. You know, I wasn't very, wasn't very you know, uh, nice about it. I should have been. I didn't show him a lot of respect, but I mean, he had me going like, yes, this is really true. And then he turns around and says, that is awful. Oh. So remember that, that uh, the, the Lord has revealed himself to us through nature. And they don't, com they don't compete. The Lord is very consistent in his revealing himself to us. And so we can, we can worship him because of that. At the same time, the devil is a powerful cunning enemy and the devil wants to destroy every plan of Jesus remember the scripture says when Jesus got up and he said the, the devil came to steal to kill and destroy and I came that you can have life and have it in abundance the devil comes to steal kill and destroy the devil is also the father of lies I'm, I'm amazed at the people who, who take something the devil said in the Bible and treat it as truth. <laughs> and that's another subject. But anyway, but the devil is, is, a, is a, a father of lies. But at the same time, he's very cunning. He's very intelligent. He's, he's been around for a long time and he's able to plot how to destroy your life and my life. He knows how to do it. And back in 1837, the devil had a plan. 
And that plan was to get us to disbelieve the Word of God. In 1837, he went with Darwin on a trip around the world, and Darwin came up with the idea that, that only the strong survived that, and the, the origin of the species, and he started looking at all these scientific things. And at the same time period, liberal theology crept into seminaries. And both had a common theme. Both was to say, the Bible is not really true. There's things in the Bible that, well, we, we need to understand. The people who wrote it weren't very intelligent. I'm thinking about, sometimes they talk about how, how big the world is. Or, I'm sorry, they were talking about the fire of God that would destroy the world. And sometimes people would say, oh, those people back then, they had no idea how huge the world was and, and what kind of fire it would take to destroy the world. And then with nuclear bombs and everything going on, we're, we're concerned because, because if, if the people in charge were to start shooting nukes at one another, we could destroy the world by fire. <laughs> and, you know, we have no idea the power of that. And God's power is so much stronger than nuclear power. Um, I think, though, looking at it, as we look at the whole issue of creation and evolution, we have to look at what kind of glasses we wear, if you're thinking about it that way. What is our mindset? Uh, to give you an example, uh, a number of years ago, I went to see the Grand Canyon. And I got to the Grand Canyon, and I looked down at the Grand Canyon, and all of a sudden, the, the, the truth of Genesis and the flood of Noah's day came flocking into my head. I mean, I looked at that because the Bible says the earth opened up and water came gushing out and flooded the whole world. The earth opened up and I looked at the Grand Canyon and I go, wow. I mean, it's obvious by looking at that, the earth opened up and, and, the, and the water, this was one of the places where the water gushed out. And I got so excited, I started preaching. I said, look, it's true, the Bible's true. And I started sharing about what, what it says in Genesis and how this is true. And if the Bible's trustworthy and true in Genesis, it's trustworthy and true in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. So whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And I got really excited about that. I go, wow, this is proof of the truth of the Bible. It's, it's proof right here of, of the flood and creation and, and everything that the Bible says is true. Well, I went back home and a couple of weeks later, I saw a documentary on the History Channel or one of those, one of the cable channels. And it was primarily about a man who was the son of a Methodist preacher, it turned out to be. He was a bit rebellious against his dad, and he went out west. He may have been the first white man to sail down the Colorado River and into the Grand Canyon. And when he went into the Grand Canyon, he looked at it, and he says, it's true, it proves evolution. Because of the layers that he saw there, he said, it's pro true, it proves evolution. But I scratched my head and I said, how can he look at that and say it? Well, the, the answer is, it's what our eyes are saying. What's, what kind of glasses are you wearing? You know, you've heard it said if you wear rose-colored glasses, everything looks nice. And if you wear psychedelic glasses, everything's kind of crazy. And, and uh, I know Craig was cleaning his glasses this morning up there. <laughs> I got to make sure my glasses are clean. If you're, uh, this morning, I thought, well, wearing contact lenses, I didn't know if my my contact lens was gumped up or if there was a lot of fog. <laughs> so, you know, it depends what, we're, what kind of glasses are we seeing through. So are we, the question is though, are we looking at the world through the eyes of the Lord? The Bible tells us to have the mind of Christ, to be looking at the world through the point of view of Jesus. In uh, the book of Ephesians, Paul gives us a great promise, a great a great statement of fact that most of us don't realize. He said, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's amazing. Our citizenship is in heaven. You know, technically, we, we shouldn't consider ourselves citizens of the United States or Canada or Germany or the United Kingdom or whatever country it might be. We should consider ourselves first and foremost citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, then we can look at everything from heaven's point of view. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places. We can look down on the world from heaven's point of view. And we need to function in life from heaven's point of view, not from an earthly point of view. So what kind of glasses are we wearing? 
Are we looking at the world through heavenly glasses? See, some are looking at heaven through worldly eyes. And we need to look through heavenly eyes. One, one little uh, thing sometimes people will say, uh, there is absolutely no scientific evidence of a young earth. Uh, I believe that the world is under 7,000 years old. The universe is under 7,000 years old. Very, very young. And people say there's no scientific evidence of a young earth. These, these religious fanatics are just, just crazy. Well, like I said, there's a tremendous amount of scientific evidence. Uh, one I will share with you real quick. When we went to the moon back in the 60s, there was a concern on the part, the part of NASA. And imagine the Soviets were having the same kind of concern. If you go to the moon, and that's the moon dust. If the moon has been sitting up there for millions and millions of years, then there'd be a tremendous amount of dust that flies around outer space and lands on the moon. And they were expecting to have a whole bunch of dust, and how are they going to land on the moon with all that dust on there? Well, they went and sent some, you know, a first ship went in there to, to land on the moon. No, no people were on it, but it was sitting there. And you know how much dust was on the moon? About 6,000 years worth of dust as they compile how much dust it should be. Now, they didn't say anything about that. They just squashed it, didn't want to say anything about it. They were just glad they could land. And, now, but that's, that's very interesting, that the moon that supposedly is up there millions and billions of years, you know, the Bible says the world's been around about less than 7,000 years, and that's how much dust is on the moon. There's many other examples, but that's just one of them. By the way, I was greatly influenced when I was in the Army, there was a fellow, his name was Dr. Bob O'Bannon, and he came over, he was a professor at Lee College in Tennessee. And he came over and spent a summer in Germany doing some stuff and teaching in a school there. And he came to our chapel, and this was really neat because he came like on a Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Saturday night, and then Sunday morning he preached in the, in the chapel. But his seminar was on science and the Bible. And he talked about creation, and he talked about the flood, and he talked about all these things. And it was amazing to see how it fits in with the Bible, with the scientific evidence and the creation, and everything fits into what the Bible says. Some people have said the Bible should not be treated as a science book. Well, it's true. It's not going to say in the Bible that water consists of two parts of hydrogen and one part of oxygen. But, but the Bible's not going to say anything contrary to the facts of creation. Now, another thing about that Dr. Bob O'Bannon explained to us is that there is a society, if you will, a fraternity of scientists. In order to be in this fraternity, you have to have an accredited master's or doctor's degree in a scientific field, field biology, archaeology, uh, you know, uh, chemistry, some scientific field. You have to have an advanced degree, accredited university, and you must believe basic Orthodox Christian stuff, like you know, Jesus was born of a virgin, he was a sinless life, he died on the cross, he rose from the dead, you know, all these basic beliefs we have as Christians, you have to believe that and have a scientific background, and you have to believe the world was created in six literal days in Genesis. It was six 24-hour days like we have today. And there's, there's thousands of scientists that are, belong to this fraternity, this society. So the scientific community is not 100% saying, oh, the Bible's a bunch of bunk and you got to believe you know, everything Darwin wrote. That's not true. That's, that, those are, they don't have much of a voice. But, but, it's but it is not true that science says one thing and Christianity says another. Now, let me move quickly and talk about why is this important. Some of you might be saying, well, can't we just live and let live? Some people say, well, God did it through evolution through billions of years. You look in the book of Genesis, and since the first day, well, the first day may have been you know, 100 billion years long or something like that. And, and, and uh, you know, we don't know that for sure. How can you be dogmatic about it? I'm not trying to be dogmatic. But here's why I think this is important. And it's, it's theological is why it's important. <laughs> and that is... Uh, listen carefully. According to evolutionary theories, there were plants and animals in the world, especially animals, who lived and died and advanced in their um, 
they just made advances. You know, this, this animal died 